But what uh, the, the editors of those volumes think is the best in the Romanesque conference series there. Uh, so uh, absolute bargains, really, uh, as such. Uh, and that brings me uh, round to the uh, now absent speaker. Marvellous. I'm, I'm so sorry, David. Uh, Dr. David Robinson, who's, uh, who stepped in uh, in fact, to, uh, to speak. Uh, and uh, David Robinson, I'm sure, is known to many of you, um, you know, as a uh, uh, sort of leading authority on the architecture of both the Augustinians and the Cistercians, um, and as the uh, uh, author of a big Society of Antiquaries volume, in fact, on the Cistercians in, uh, in Wales. Um, and he's been involved in uh, some recent work, a re-evaluation, really, at Tintin Abbey, and it's about Tintin that David is going to speak. Yeah? <clears throat> Thank you, John. In 2031, now just seven years away, Tintin Abbey will be 900 years old. I'm not quite that old, but I've known the ruins for more than five decades, and I thought I knew them rather well. Seems we can all be naive from time to time. All of us, I suggest, still have a good deal more to learn about this iconic site. Get used to the technology. Tintin is, of course, one of the loveliest and best known monastic sites in the entire British Isles. Aside from its architectural glories, much of the Abbey's considerable charm rests in its spectacular landscape setting amid Wordsworth's steep and lofty cliffs on the banks of a great sweeping bend in his Sylvan Wye. The significance of the Abbey Ruins to British cultural life was recognised in 1900, 1901 when they were taken into the care of HM Office of Woods and Forests on behalf of the nation. Since that time, a succession of government departments has been responsible for the ongoing conservation and presentation of the monument. In 1984, those duties passed to CADU, the body that now serves as Welsh Government's Historic Environment Service. The primary responsibility of all government departments entrusted with the custody of the site has always been one of conservation, ensuring that structural integrity of the monument ensuring the structural integrity of the monument as a whole. Unfortunately, however, the stone used by the medieval masons for the construction of both the Abbey Church and the extensive array of monastic buildings, especially the locally quarried tint and sandstone, is particularly susceptible to decay. General erosion in the form of lamination and surface spalling remains a recurring issue. After centuries of what today we might call conservation neglect, all of the fundamental structural issues with the ruins were initially addressed during an extended program of first round preservation and repair. Spanning the years 1901 to 1928, and under the auspices of two different government departments, the Woods and Forests and the Office of Works, the work involved several astonishing feats of engineering the more remarkable considering the early date at which they were carried out. In the years after the Second World War, the need for further preservation became increasingly apparent. Eventually, from the early 1970s, a somewhat protracted sequence of additional works to the church continued through to the 1980s. Thereafter, what might be regarded as the third significant round of conservation uh, on the Abbey Church was carried out between 1999 and 2010. An expectation, an expectation that the most recent works might have freed the monument of the need for further scaffolding, quotes, for at least the next 50 years, has sadly proved unfounded. In particular, ongoing erosion throughout the Abbey Church has led to increasing amounts of falling masonry, as captured in this slide, monitoring the 10 months 
from October 2019 to July 2020. There is no single cause for this erosion. The water ingress into the masonry cores of the walls is clearly significant, especially when it cannot exit through the incredibly hard mortar used in the early conservation programs. There, is also, there are also bedding difficulties, since the medieval masons were occasionally obliged to work against the plains. And climate change, too, has begun to play a significant role. The difficulties are widespread, whether considering the rough, coarse stonework in the body of the walls, or the finer dressed elements of windows, piers, and arcades. Indeed, original 13th century dressed masonry continues to be lost as we can see in, in, in the north aisle of the presbytery just last year. In the rear arch of one of the aisle windows, a coarse roll moulding had hitherto survived complete and had not been identified as especially vulnerable in a pre-conservation survey undertaken in 2021. A significant loss in this area just 15 months later highlights the dynamic nature of the ongoing decay. We're not talking about the odd bit of stone here and there either, as you can see from this, um, when it, of it, from this view of it gathered together in a wheelbarrow. And I, I'm told just this morning that um, a higher section of that roll has collapsed again, again in the last couple of weeks. Such ongoing fall, falls emphasize the need for further investigation and specialist input as the conservation work is put in hand. In sum, then, by the late summer of 2020, such was the scale of the problem, it became necessary to close off much of the Abbey Church to the visiting public, with access subsequently limited to just the covered south aisle of the nave. Early in 2021, Cadu initiated a fourth major round of conservation at Tintin. Indeed, although the initial focus will be on the church, in the longer term, the work is expected to extend to all areas of the site where significant erosion is evident. At this stage, it's not possible to offer an accurate time frame for the completion of the programme, but it's not unreasonable to think in terms of conservation 2021 to 31, with an aspired end date coinciding with the 900th anniversary of the Abbey's foundation. In the first instance, David Hodges and his team were engaged to carry out a sequence of detailed pre-conservation surveys of the masonry and to report with options and advice on appropriate treatments. For these purposes, the church was divided into five zones, with the work beginning at the east end and working through to the west front. I'll get this in a moment. Employing fresh photogram photogrammetric, photogrammetric elevations, the Orges team have produced a comprehensive set of drawings in which every section of the church has been marked up, similar to this example showing the arcade in the south transept. The full suite of drawings do incidentally cover both faces. The markups show, show various details of historic conservation interventions such as the extensive application of copper bands in early programs, as well as statements on the condition of the fabric today. As with all big projects of this nature, an overarching project management structure has been put in place for what is very much a multidisciplinary program. Within this, Will Davis, the Inspector of Ancient Monuments at Caddo for this region, has assembled a specialist research team with its members offering a range of expertise. Key contributions have already been made by Martin Rosevere of Tiger Geophysics, by Richard Lewis of Black Mountains Archaeology, and Ross Cook of Archaeodomus. If those of you who don't know Ross, we'll be meeting him in, in Pembrokeshire later in the year. Together with something of a coordinating program of historical and architectural research by myself, Fundamentally, the role of this team is to ensure that the immediately pressing physical works to the Abbey buildings will be managed according to the principles of informed conservation. In the longer term, the results of all research will doubtless continue to guide the ongoing conservation and management of the entire monument in Caddo's care. Now, to be clear, when I refer to research team, 
it would be wrong to be thinking in terms of pure academic research, sadly. The research program as a whole is very much driven by the conservation need. One important um, strand of the work, for instance, is to try and document once and for all each and every conservation intervention to the original medieval fabric, a huge task in itself. On occasion, there is a steer, as with the date stone seen here on the rebuilt doorway from the so-called infirmary passage into the North Presbytery Isle. There again, as with the extensive lead capping, now, which now covers the tracery in the great north transept window, there is no clear or fully documented record of precisely when it was introduced. Indeed, there are hundreds of interventions in total, varying enormously in scale from simple copper bands wrapped around failing tracery to entirely rebuilt piers. Sorting them out involves a vast trawl of historic documentary and illustrative sources, coupled with a deep, detailed study of the masonry itself. In time, Ross Cook will eventually be producing layered versions of the new photogrammetric plots, beginning with a record of all that is done in the current programme. But he will also be generating layers representing the key conservation episodes of the past, Alas, the crisp channeled cusping seen in this clear story window in the north transept is hardly reflective of the way that original masonry survives. The cusping elements of the trefoil heads and much of the mullions are all grey Forest of Dean sandstone and will be recorded as part of the early 1980s phase of work in this area. To take another strand of fresh research and recording emerging from the conservation need, we might consider burials. From the start, geophysics indicated that multiple inhumations lie to be discovered across the east end of the church in both the presbytery and the transepts. There's a surprise. Concerns were raised when it became apparent just how extensive scaffolding is these days. Such is its weight, it certainly has the potential to damage the archeological levels. We are told that there, could be an that there could even be an accident where a hollow grave to give way beneath, beneath the weight of the scaffolding. The extent to which late the late medieval Cistercians at Tinton were prepared to accept lay burials in the Abbey Church has indeed been borne out by the recent excavations, which we'll come on to. But there is far more by way of background material for us to consider. Indeed, Combining just the documentary sources with surviving memorial sculpture, we already have evidence for up to 40 burials at Tinton. As the first trenches were opened in the presbytery last year, it would have been a cold heart that was not intrigued to discover if there were any evidence of the tomb of the great William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and his wife Anne Devereux. Builder of the spectacular Raglan Castle, of course, Herbert was executed in the wake of the Battle of Edgecourt Edgecott in 1469 and was buried at Tinton. According to the herald, William Fellows, who visited the abbey in 1531, the tomb Herbert shared with his wife lay before the, before the high altar. Again, a sizable number of grave slabs continued to lie exposed in various locations around the site, such as this one striking fragment bearing the effigy of an abbot. When it was found in the 1750s, we are told, the gilding around the head was then as fresh as the day it was first laid on. Sadly, this important piece of, of effigial sculpture has for too long been allowed to fall into ever-increasing decay without proper study. Moreover, we know that the Office of Works uncovered several graves during explorations in the early 20th century. In the case of the example shown here, other than this photograph, we appear to have absolutely no record of the discovery, not even a basic location. I'll be picking up on some of this again later, but for the moment, the point that needs to be made is that even in a program essentially designed to resolve the current round of conservation needs at the monument, it's virtually impossible to avoid a number of deeply interesting research questions. Why on earth wouldn't you, in fact? 
Now, thinking ahead to where this all might lead, I would argue that the research findings emerging from the project can be marshaled under three, head, three broad headings. Indeed, to put it another way, we are dealing, we are, we are, put it another way, we're already able to throw fresh light on what we might be called the three ages of Tintin Abbey. From the expression on their faces, this group may not look entirely convinced, but my first heading has to be the Cistercian, has to be Cistercian Tintin, or what is known about the history and architecture of the medieval abbey. Of course, it would be impossible to cover the background in full this evening, and in any case, I'm confident that it isn't really necessary for a BAA audience. I will, though, mention a few of the basics. In short, Tintin was founded in 1131 by Walter Fitzrichard de Clare, the Anglo-Norman Lord of Chepstow. It was, it was not just the first Cistercian landfall in Wales, but stood in the very vanguard of the order's settlement of the British Isles as a whole, preceded only by Waverley Abbey in Surrey, founded in 1128, three years earlier. Both houses were colonised from Lomon, itself a daughter of House of Cito. In terms of, of the buildings at Tintin, what we see now represents some 400 years of ongoing construction. Indeed, very few generations of the community will have escaped the site of scaffolding in one or other area of the monastery. By the mid 12th century, it's very likely that the monks had erected a comparatively modest Romanesque church of eyeless cruciform plan, which I hope you can see is, in, is the gray, gray in this. A pattern known from, another, from other first-generation Cistercian sites in Britain. Early progress also appears to have been made with three principal ranges of monastic buildings situa situated around an open cloister garth on the north, unusually, side of the nave. What little survives above ground has been, marked, has been masked by later construction. Even so, foundations of some parts of the 12th century church were uncovered in the early 20th century, or so we believed. Since then, the posited outline of the presbytery, transepts, and south side of the nave have been marked out in the turf with stone or concrete outlines. In the circumstances, the reconstruction drawing shown here can offer no more than an impression of the buildings. The scale of the church can nevertheless be defended, and it's very important that we bear in mind that this building served the growing community for more than 100 years, possibly as many as 140. Doubtless, many monks would have died in these early years, and they are likely to have been buried somewhere to the east, to the south and east of the Romanesque presbytery. In the event, sustained growth in the numbers of both choir monks and lay brothers led to an expansion in the scale of the initial buildings during the first half of the 13th century, the red areas um, in, the, in the plan. I've argued elsewhere that there is much in the architectural detail of the north and east claustral ranges to suggest that the work was carried out in the time of Abbot Ralph, about 1232-45, or it was centered on this period, I would argue with the greatly enlarged chapter house and the monks' refectory, for example, significant early Gothic spaces in their own right. Tintin's greatest glory, however, was its splendid high Gothic church, built to replace the much smaller Romanesque structure of the pioneering years. Um, clearly there, it's yellow, orange, and purple areas. Documentary evidence suggests that the construction program spanned more than 30 years, with work in initiated around 1269 during the time of Abbot John. By 1288, the monks were able to take possession of the presbytery and to celebrate their first mass at the high altar. And 13 years later, in 1301, it must have been Abbot Ralph, about 1279-1305, who presided over a full dedication of the new church almost certainly in the presence of the patron at that time, Roger Bigard, Earl of Norfolk. Two more significant points are to be observed while looking at this slide. The first, of course, is that the new church extended significantly south and east of its predecessor. 
but we should also consider that the, con that the construction programme is bound to have led to major disturbances in the existing ground level. In its rather plain internal elevations of two storeys, there is some argument to suggest a degree of Cistercian restraint. There again, the original form, execution, and scale of the windows in the east and west fronts represent a marked step forward. This, coupled with what we know of the liturgical fittings, including the elaborate pulpitum of around 1325-30, surely pulled the building much closer to cathedral splendor. Tintin II would undoubtedly have been one of the grandest and most sophisticated pieces of ecclesiastical archi architecture ever to have been constructed in medieval Wales. There isn't really time to dwell on later medieval construction of the site, which included a notable expansion of the abbot's apartments in the 14th century and the beginnings of, an elaborate, new of, of elaborate new cloister walks in the mid-15th century. And I must move us through to the suppression on, of Tintin on the 3rd of September, 1536. In March of the following year, the site and buildings of the dissolved monastery were granted to Henry Somerset, 2nd Earl of Worcester. Thereafter, and very significantly, Somerset and his direct descendants effectively controlled the fate of the Abbey ruins through to the beginning of the 20th century. This brings me to the second of my three ages in the, his, in the site's history, which we might think of as a romantic Tintin. There is a prelude to this in the immediate wake of the suppression, of course, but we are, we are essentially dealing with the years from, say, the 1730s through to the end of the 19th century. This is the, tin, the, the Tintin of the romantic and the picturesque. It's the Tintin too of antiquarians, slowly but surely morphing into architects and historians with deeper understanding. Most of all, it is the Tintin Abbey of popular culture, the place that everyone who is anyone is talking about, one of the greatest attractions for sightseers in the whole of early British tourism. Quickly, though, let's begin with that prelude I've mentioned, uh, that I've mentioned. In short, we can be reasonably sure that soon after the departure of the Cistercian community, there would have been a, at least some degree of calculated destruction of the Abbey buildings. Elsewhere, for instance, the Crown's agents often arranged for the roofs across much of the conventual church to be removed, windows smashed, and, 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 it, and the quantity of every ounce of valuable lead assessed and set aside, usually for the king's use. At Tintin, such is the regularity of the surviving vault springers throughout the nave, the entire presbytery, and the transepts. One is tempted to suggest that the vaults and cells were removed in a systematic manner. Moreover, it may not be unreasonable to speculate that the north arcade of the nave was deliberately undermined and brought down, thereby rendering the building effectively ruinous. Every other section of the, of the church survives to the wall heads, completely to the wall heads, except for this one, this one arcade. In point of fact, by the beginning of the 18th century, the general form of the Abbey Church was much as we find it today, as evidenced by one of the earliest depictions of the site, namely the Buck Brothers drawing of 1732. The Buck image is somewhat stylized, of course, but the building was clearly without roofs or any surviving vaulting by this date. All four gables are shown virtually intact, but there is no indication that a central tower ever existed. From, the, from accounts recorded around the turn of the 18th century, it was almost certainly Charles Somerset, fourth Duke of Beaufort, who for, first took a new pride in the ruins of the abbey, which his family had held since the, since the suppression. Shortly before his death, Somerset seems to initiate its steps to curb almost 200 years of neglect. About the year 1756, or nearly that period, we are told, the estate steward, Mr. Harding, directed workmen to clear the interior of the Abbey Church, then choked up with rubbish several feet above the present surface. Upwards of 100 workmen were employed in the labour, part of which rubbish they threw into the River Wye, and what was useful 
they spread over the adjoining grounds. The ground was leveled and turfed, and fallen architectural fragments were heaped in ornamental piles around the piers of the presbytery and the nave arcades, together with the occasional piece of tomb sculpture. An attempt was made to protect the good works from vandalism, notably with locking doors hung at the west front and other entry points. Any number of late 18th and 19th century tourist accounts refer to these works and to the turf in particular, care for which we see in one of Turner's watercolours of the 1790s. In 1826, for example, Thomas Fosbrook noted, whatever may be the offence to the picturesque in landscape consideration, by ironing the surface of the grass as if it were linen and keeping the interior of the church in a state of, of green lawn is indispensable if people are to walk about it pleasantly. All in all, the fourth duke's action seemed to have anticipated the enormous growth in Tintin's popularity in the late 18th century. From the 1780s in particular, the abbey became a magnet for, for a considerable influx of tourists and travellers with a taste for ruins, and for Gothic ruins in particular. Gentlemen and ladies of birth and education, landscape commentators, poets, writers and artists all came in considerable numbers, many of them in search of a Gothic rush, otherwise known as the popular notions of the romantic and the picturesque. Some arrived at the crack of dawn, others remained until moonlight for the thrill of seeing the ruins by torchlight. Charles Heath, the, Mon the Monmouth printer, guidebook writer and bookseller, could barely keep pace with the demand for his popular guide to Tintin, first published in 1793. Heath had produced no fewer than 11 editions by 1828. It remains, by the way, an invaluable source for early antiquarian discoveries at the site. We must, of course, view all this through the lens of the highly fashionable wide tour more generally. Many of the early tourists arrived on relatively small boats, having navigated the river all the way from Ross or down from Monmouth, and generally ending at Chepstow. Even so, by common consent, Tintin was widely recognised as the chief Gothic glory to be encountered on the river, as well as the most beautiful and picturesque view. The coming of the Wye Valley Railway in 1876 might have represented the beginning of a new era but there was no sign that Tintin had lost its appeal. There is so much more one could say about this phase in Tintin's history, but I must confine myself to one more eye-opener. At least for me, it, it was an eye-opener. In the early 1830s, the young AWN Pugin visited the site. His diary entry suggests that he expected to be impressed, and indeed he was with the setting and the general scene but Pugin was far less enthusiastic about the architecture, thinking it rather modest and repetitive. It's surely all the more remarkable then that when Pugin was entrusted with the creation of one of the installations within the Great Exhibition in London's Hyde Park in 1851, he should have chosen the West Portal at Tinton as the inspiration for the entrance to his medieval court. Perhaps he was obliged to give way to popularity, but in any case, the replica doorway would have been seen by many of the six million visitors to the Great Exhibition in that year. This, in turn, must surely have enhanced the public perception of the architectural qualities of Tintin itself. And, and on it goes with, with, with the souvenir, um, with the souvenir uh, mugs, or the equivalent of today's mugs, certainly pottery and china, um, engravings, prints by, by, the, by the bucket load. And so we move to the last of my three phases in Tintin's story, which might be called Monument Tintin, namely its existence as a national monument in the care of the state. This photograph, taken in the very early 20th century, before 1905, certainly before 1905, shows the interior of the church immediately before any major conservation works began. 
On succeeding his father to become ninth Duke of Beaufort in 1899, Henry Somerset decided to sell his Tipton and Raglan estates, preferring instead to consolidate the family's position around Badminton. The Crown, acting through HM Office of Woods and Forests, eventually paid the Duke the sum of £15,000 for Tintin Abbey. In November 1900, E. Stafford Howard, Commissioner of the Woods and Forests, wrote to F. W. Waller, resident architect of the Dean and Chapter of Gloucester Cathedral, inviting him to, quote, to make, a once, a, to make at once a close inspection of the walls so far as possible and report to me on what you think is immediately necessary to prevent any mischief during the coming winter. Waller was delighted to accept and thereafter was engaged to supervise the preservation of the abbey. In the event, the ruins were in a particularly fragile condition, far more so than the authorities initially recognized. Waller was to be involved for more than 10 years. His principal contributions include works to the Great East Window, the Eastern Crossing Arch seen here, the North Transept and the West Front. From a very early stage, the architect had argued that the work itself should be undertaken by a firm thoroughly vested in church work and Gothic construction, but he was obliged to accept the department's decision to engage the Cardiff-based builders and contractors E. Turner and Sons. In 1904-05, it was they who were responsible for replacing the vast central mullion in the Great East Window. From there, energies were swept switched to the eastern arch of the crossing, where a veritable forest of timber scaffolding was shoring up the, was, um, and shoring was erected in 1907. On close inspection, the structure was discovered to be badly fractured, and in March of the following year, Turner and Sons took down the entire arch to the level of the springing points. They were obliged to rebuild it twice over, given Waller's dissatisfaction with the original attempt. Um, it's quite, quite a story in itself. Even the correspondence on, on this is sort of this thick with everyone passing the buck about in typical civil service fashion about who was responsible for this. But Waller got his way. They took it down. Um, having built it without, without his agreement, they had to take it down and rebuild it again. But it still wasn't, um, it still wasn't to his complete satisfaction. For example, all this um, toothing that we see representing the vault over the crossing, they, they smoothed, all that out, smoothed all that out. They thought that looked rather ugly. Um, and so it's, if you look at the face today, it's quite smooth. In 1913, 14, over, the year, over a year period really, responsibility for Tintin passed from the woods and forests to HM Office of Works, where the ancient monuments department under Charles Reed Piers was very much beginning to find its feet. Piers, Piers is principal departmental colleague and eventually the director of works and chief architect was the truly remarkable Frank Baines. Together with these two men, together these two men were responsible for overseeing the innovative and eventually highly successful conservation program at the Abbey, which ran from the transfer through to the late 1920s. Vast amounts were done, involving huge interventions to the medieval fabric, including the laying of so-called ferro-concrete beams into most of the wall tops. But if there is one element that sums up the bravado of the entire programme, it was the enormously daring approach to the South Arcade in the nave, which stands out. Baines was seriously concerned with this, with this area from the very outset, fearing full-scale collapse. But early disagreements over an, over an appropriate solution were effectively shelved during the war years. By 1919, however, there were two proposals on the table, neither winning universal support, either within or beyond the department. The one involved the construction of large stepped buttresses against three of the piers, though this was abhorrent to some. In the end, however, and in the face of considerable opposition, not least from SPAB, Piers and Baines were eventually to push ahead with a two-pronged approach to the problem with the arcade. On the one hand, the wall at clear story level was bowing inwards, was 
um, whereas the weight of the upper wall robbed the vaulting, robbed the vaulting support was beginning to crush the slender piers below. The bowing issue was addressed with something called a lattice girder roof, an engineering solution that anchored the outer aisle wall to the in inner arcade and clear story. With this done, great brick supports were built under each arch of the arcade. The stone piers were taken down one by one, and great steel stanchions were inserted, were inserted underpinning the upper walls. Each course of masonry from the piers was then hollowed out before they were eventually wrapped around the stanchions. The result speaks for itself. The vast majority of the visiting public is completely oblivious and, the structurally, and, and, the, and structurally, the arcade remains perfectly sound. All in all, the conservation program by the Office of Works, as the um, beg your pardon, all in all, as the conservation program by the Office of Works moved forward, the whole appearance of the Abbey was gradually transformed. The ivy and other growth so beloved by the early tourists, but which had caused so much decay to the stonework, was entirely removed. Many post-monastic encroachments were cleared away, and more of the abbey buildings were uncovered and displayed. After many years of disruption, with the interior of the abbey church still to be turfed afresh, in August 1928, the Daily Telegraph could announce restoration of Tintin Abbey, scheme practically complete, and indeed it was. After almost three decades of work, with contributions from two major government departments, and a huge body of extremely talented personnel. The first round conservation, um, first round program of conservation at Tintin had reached a point where the scaffolding and ladders, spades and wheelbarrows could finally be taken away. For Charles Pierce, at any rate, quotes, no one would want to touch our work for at least 50 years, and he trusted over 100 years. Well, I've mentioned how naive this sounds today, though that is very much with the benefit of hindsight. I've also mentioned the need to return to the fairly major conservation, to fairly major conservation work through the 1970s and 1980s. And CADO began its, its third round program of works in 1999. Many of the windows on the south side of the nave were conserved at this time, including significant stone replacement. The red Hollington area sandstone has not yet blended with the original Tintin material, but we may see how that pans out. I've already outlined, too, the need to replace the tracery in one of the oculi in the Great West window. From ground level, at least, I would argue this seems rather more successful, but again, we must see how it weathers. Well, here we are. 15 years after the completion of the last scheme, with yet another important round of conservation in prospect. And it is primarily in connection with the scale and weight of the scaffolding that certain conditions have been placed on the Scheduled Monument Consent. In particular, Will Davis, the inspector, has argued persuasively that we need to know more about the nature of the underlying archaeology within and around the Abbey Church. Now, there remains something of a misconception in the literature that Tintin was excavated by Harold Breakspear in the early 1900s. True, he was given some assistance from the Office of Woods to uncover the layout of the infirmary, in particular, in 1907-8, but otherwise Breakspear's work in the church itself was confined to a single trench dug in the nave ready for a visit by the Royal Archaeological Institute in 1904. I'm not sure if we consider this to be controlled excavation, certainly not by the standards of today. And the same might be said of the trenches we see here, dug in about 1919-20, almost certainly on the instruction of Charles Piers. Doubtless in correspondence with Breakspear, Piers was keen to uncover more evidence for the original 12th century church, Tintin I. With, with plans to mark out its footprint in the existing turf, itself representing the pavement of Tintin II. Alas, there is nothing by way of explanation to accompany these photographs in the official records. They reveal, nevertheless, that in addition to the simple linear trenching, 
at least one larger area was opened up. Situated between the two northern crossing piers, the work here came down on the grave of Nicholas of Flandaff. That's this in case. Yeah. With its inscribed grave marker set into the partially surviving slabbed stone floor of Tintin One. Again, given the lack of any record, it's a question of interpretation. But it, would, but it would appear that Breakspeare became convinced by the various findings of 1919-20, subsequently modifying his plan of Tintin I quite considerably. The presbytery was to become marginally wider. So here, here it is. Um, I hope you can see that thin outline of it there. Presbytery area here um, was wider in the second plan. Um, the west end of the nave... Um, had not been discovered. It, the, 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 the wall just fades out. Um, they had found the, uh, located the west end, and in fact, part of this plinth with the um, with the um, um, clasping buttress on the corner, part of the plinth level of that um, is in a is in a little buried beneath a grill still there. Um, and in particular, rather than the single chapels to each transept, matching what Breakspeare had excavated before 1903 at Waverley Abbey, of course, um, was now changed. For, for reasons lost to us, Breakspeare and Piers became convinced that Tintin II had paired chapels to each transept, which has a more significant impact when one works out the chronology of the buildings um, on the north side than on the south side. There is a reason for dwelling on this episode, which I shall come on to, but for the moment I can tell you that prior to last year, the only other piece of archaeological work in the church was undertaken in 1997, a limited exercise within the nave, seeking to confirm the position of the pulpitum, which apparently it did. All in all, given the lack of detailed records, there wasn't much to go on in terms of what, what survives beneath the turf, how deep the stratigraphy may be, and so on. Indeed, it was in this context that Black Mountain's archaeology, under the direction of Richard Lewis, assisted by Ross Cook, was asked to carry out an evaluation exercise. Last May, they began by hand-stripping the turf in the southeast corner of the church, the area which will be scaffolded in phase one. We are... The, the scaffolding is sort of arriving on site imminently, by the way. Having agonised, and I mean agonised, over whether we were removing precious turf set down by the fourth Duke of Beaufort in the 1750s, it quickly became apparent this was not the case. Indeed, some of the turf had clearly been grown commercially, on a, with, on a plastic netting base, fragments of which were discovered. And beneath the turf was a sort of hardcore drainage layer dating from the earliest phase of conservation. From there, and very much in sum, the overarching principle for the work was to stop where the archaeology began, unless there was some good reason to go further. That was disappointing to begin with. In the event, though, it was decided that a number of trenches were needed to assess the nature of the deeper stratigraphy, especially in those areas which would be bearing the greatest pressure from the scaffolding, both internally and externally. In phase one, as we see from this slide, the footings of the external buttresses in this area were exposed with a view if they, if, um, to seeing if they might support uprights and apparently they will. Internally, meanwhile, a long trench, I think this is trench seven, this, I don't know if you can just see the black outline of that trench, um, and a second, running north-south, um, were, were, um, were excavated. In, um, after a break through late July, early August, 
with phase two and phases two and three of the works, don't ask me why it's two and three, but it's something to do with the, with the overall planning um, um, of the project. Uh, they moved into the north side of the presbytery and the north transept. Further trenches were addressed to open areas of, um, to address specific points in the evaluation exercise, if, that, if I'm not rambling. It was more or less a continuation of the north-south trench that we saw in the first phase there, running um, northwards with an extension to it there. Um, and very small, this, this area, which we'll, we'll, which we'll look at in a moment, um, I'm not quite sure where trenches begin and end there, um, but there was quite a lot of work done in this area um, uh, in, the, in, in the end. I'm biased, of course, but as someone long resigned to the prospect of never seeing such hidden insights into the history of this great monument, I'm not ashamed to say the whole exercise to date has been tremendously exciting. To be involved has been a great privilege. I'm not, of course, the archaeologist in charge, and we must acknowledge that the post-excavation work is very much in its infancy. In short, therefore, I can do no more than offer you an overview of what's been uncovered so far. Um, I think I meant to show that slide um, as I was giving you that last bit. So we're in the north transept there, nearing the end of the excavations in, um, in December, but I'll come back to that. Now, I tried, I tried writing to these slides, but it's much easier to take, take you through what I'm going to show you. And of course, I can only give you, it's like I, didn't, I copied and pasted a caption there and didn't get rid of it. Um, I'm only going to be give, able to give you the highlights, and if, if you want, we can discuss afterwards, or you can ask me more afterwards. And, and I'm going to run in a sort of chronological, a roughly chronological order. So um, let's begin in the area of the, um, with the, with the um, work on the um, Tintin One, which at one stage I was beginning to think, um, would we ever find or would they ever find? It was um, in phase two when this, that, that north-south trench I showed you um, got close to the um, infirmary passage doorway, which is this. Um, they, they, they struck on the, um, the original wall. So we're, we're in this area of the church here. Um, so there, were, there, was definite, there, is some, there is definite evidence for to match what we see on plan, what we see on, let's call it the Breakspear Piers plan, because it's a combination of both of them. There is definite evidence for the South Presbytery Wall and for the return um, uh, the, of the um, East Gable Wall. Earlier in the in the summer, however, when when in, in phase one of the work, this started to ring alarm bells. This is the long trench running from, um, from the east window right through to the crossing. And when coming to this area, which, which is meant to mark, as you see, the east wall of the transept, there is no sign in the section of any, of any wall face and nothing of any wall within the, the space where it's marked out. The same is true um, in phase two. Um, uh, trying to look, I'm, I'm seeing a slide on the side. Same is true um, in this area where there should be a wall, the east wall of the transept running south from the, from the, 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 um, the presbytery wall. Again, no sign of a robber trench um, or any sign of walling in, in that area marked out between the tram lines. This becomes really disconcerting in the north, in the current north transept. We're in this sort of area that you see on, on, the, on the plan. There should, if this is accurate, be an east wall um, for the north transept in that point, um, or it's there, it's marked there, as you can see. Absolutely no sign of it, again, at all. Again, we've got the, we've got the north side of the presbytery wall, but no sign of the eastern wall of the, of the transepts. In short, and it is very much in short, this throws open um, the entire, um, you know, the accuracy as a whole of what, what we are seeing in what I've believed, um, I've written about as if it is gospel, 
um, Richard Halsey has also written about it, of course, even referring to these responds and what they may mean in terms of vaulting or not. Um, there, there's actually nothing, nothing quite like that there. Um, it's quite disconcerting. Um, but as I say, we're, 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 we still haven't done the post X, we still haven't sorted it all out. But there are questions to answer. Connected with the, with, the, um, with the first phase church, there are undoubtedly a number of burials. I'm not going to show you burial after burial. These are two, just two. Um, this um, is, is well, we're obviously looking east in this way, so the east window is above his head um, and the crossing to the feet. Um, and this was in the long trench again, dug down this area and, um, and, and, and has to be, one imagines, um, a, the, um, the cemetery of, the, of Tintin I, um, presumably the monastic cemetery of Tintin I. This, this, these legs are beneath the north-south trench that was dug in the presbytery. And again, this one, is, this one or its neighbour, there are two in this area, was, um, was, was cut into when, when dropping in one of the piers um, of, the, um, of the arcade at this point. In terms of the interface between um, Tintin I and Tintin II, um, uh, Richard um, is very clear in his mind that wherever you are on the site, both externally or close to the walls and internally, there is a definite makeup area marked by an area of what he describes as green sandstone hardcore. Um, there's a layer in, in the section which below we know is um, pre-Tintin pre 2 levels, above is, is, is Tintin 2 levels. There are the, the findings on, on Tintin 2 itself, again, there are lots, but I can only give you a flavour. This um, uh, cutaway reconstruction um, done for me by Terry Ball many years ago now, um, we took a stab at, for example, at, um, at the the um, liturgical arrangement. The screen, of course, there is evidence for the screening still surviving. It's interesting to know how long it did survive um, within, the life of the, within the life of the late medieval church. Come on to that a little bit more. Um, but the, the stubs of these um, uh, screen walls, both in the nave and in the presbytery, all survives. Um, the aisles... We, know, we now know were, were tiled as well. Lots and lots of fragments of, um, of broken tile, mostly late 13th, fairly early 14th century, um, Clarendon style in origin, but you know, um, in line with what we find at um, the Hales, at the, at the, come on Robinson, the Cleave pavement, the, um, the Hales tiles and so on, with um, royal arms, the, um, uh, Richard, King, Richard Earl of Cornwall, King of the Romans, declare arms, um, the whole works, um, which, which, we, which is, it's now argued that these tiles may have originated, all of them, um, in the Glastonbury area, in fact. But lots of broken tiles. We'd given up completely on finding any surviving tile pavements, um, surviving tile pavements anywhere. They'd all been... Um, been uh, dug out in the 19th century and on into the Ministry of Works period. No um, areas of tile pavement. But um, this, this um, uh, footing here must be to support a screen of some kind. It could have been an open work tracery screen rather than a solid wall. It's not a very m massive foundation. That is in um, this area here. And on the south side, there was um, in the south aisle, there was one in the same position with possibly a step before it. So there's a, there's a uh, detail there that's been picked out. In constructing the church, in constructing um, Tintin II, in this area, which may have been, the, which, which has to have been the cemetery of Tintin I, one of those burials that I showed you earlier, for example, the Tintin I burial was in this area. Two, two, um, Charnel, small charnel pits with quite, quite a number of bones in them were discovered. This one, as you can see, is outside the, um, the 
south aisle of the Tintin II Presbytery, and this one is outside the east end of the Presbytery. Presumably, the working um, hypothesis for the moment is these are bodies that are disturbed as Tintin II is constructed, um, and they have been uh, placed in small charnel pits outside the new building. The, the trench that was dug north-south um, along um, uh, the south side of the presbytery in the south aisle, that's this trench here, any number of burials, well, at least, at least three burials, that's, um, there are probably more, one of which you can, you can probably not see, you may be able to just see, there are nails, um, there are rusty nails along here um, indicating a wooden coffin, whereas here we have a stone-kissed coffin and, and there's, there's traces of another there, um, all within this trench. This one in particular has to have been cut. Well, they all have to have been cut through the tile floor, and presumably not a massive amount of time later, which begs questions, in my mind at least, as to how they finished off the tile floor once they had um, inserted the grave, whether there are monuments above or they patch in tiles, goodness knows. This is um, just poking, poking a, 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 an iPhone through a hole in the side of that um, kissed burial, um, and uh, you can see no sign of a wooden coffin inside here. Um, but the, the burial is put straight into the kist itself. Two more burials. One, um, we, so we've got stone kists, we've got wooden coffins, this one is just an earthen burial um, in, the, um, in the body of the south um, transept, just, just west of the um, chapel's arcade. Chapel arcade is just about here. This one is, is, is in the north transept, very close to the screen wall between the north and south transepts. Who knows whether the screen wall had to be removed to insert this burial. And there are in indications that this had been... Um, how does one put it, interfered with in the past, there is some indication that this is not in its original form, even possibly the, the possibility that it might have been moved from elsewhere. And in the north side of the, um, of the, uh, of the presbytery in the north aisle, or between, um, between the arcade piers, I'm rambling here too much, forgive me, we are, we are here at a point where there should be a stone screen wall, one of those ones I showed you in the reconstruction drawing, between these, between the, these two piers. To, to put in this burial, that wall must have been removed. So how soon after the, the, the church finished did this go in? More interestingly in many ways is the burial is very makeshift. So for someone in such a grand position, on the right hand of God, so to speak, um, before the high altar... Um, it's cobbled together from other fragments. You can see the chamfer on the edge of this north, the north side. This, this, this is a lid from another, from another tomb. This, the lid itself overshoots the full length of the, of the coffin, so it, it would come to about here on the coffin. Inside, the body itself was dis first discovered in that 1919-1920 work um, of, of when Piers did the, the, the trenching work. They opened it, and there is a, a, a short report on this published in 1938 in Archaeologia Cambrensis um, by Wilfred Hemp. He describes this as an oxhide burial. They're quite rare, and all of the known early ones, I'm not going to give you chapter and verse on this at the moment, the latest is sort of late, is late 13th century. Um, so... It's, it's intriguing as to why this burial in a significant place in the presbytery in a uh, is put in a makeshift coffin in a sort of antiquated um, uh, burial um, rite, if you like. Oh, God. Um, and there again, a slide, um, uh, with a camera just put through, the, through a gap, the, um, the oxide is still there. Um, the team are still umming and ahhing about whether now is the time to capture every last thing we can about this burial. Air will have got in again um, through the cracks, as you can see. You can get a hand in with a camera. And whether we should gather 
every specialist we can think of um, to, to get as much information as possible out of this um, before, it, um, uh, before it's lost. Moving on in time, um, there are, um, in the area of the presbytery, one of the first areas they came across, some of this um, crushed material here seems to indicate or may indicate suppression period, um, uh, may, uh, suppression period works with one post hole here, which may, may possibly have been related to scaffolding um, as part of the dissolution process, as part of pulling down the vaults, for example. Outside the north side of the presbytery, um, so this is the this is the east wall of the of the of the north transept chapels, the north wall of the presbytery here. So it's in that in that in that elbow between the chapels and the presbytery wall. This wall has has puzzled all of us. We don't quite not know what this is yet. It seems to be stratified. Um, in the, in the sense that it must be pre-disillusion, in that in this area, a large, very large quantity, a significant quantity of um, stained glass was found on top of the on top of the remains. So it seems to predate the suppression, unless the glass survived for much longer. Um, and I'm intrigued by this um, by this burning on this red stone that we can see here. You can see it's been scored. There's some kind of hearth being here and it's just flying a kite as to whether this could possibly be related to post-suppression um, uh, melting of, um, uh, of raw material or um, reused material. Later again, um, the, the, these, um, this um, is one of the burials which, which featured on the, um, the television program, which, which um, I can't remember. Um, Digging into Britain or Digging for Britain or whatever it's called with Alice Roberts. This is one of the, the, the um, skeletons that were the, that, that they um, we've got no detailed pathology yet on any of the skeletons, by the way. They've all gone to Cardiff University. All the ones that that um, felt would not survive as they were with backfilling have gone to Cardiff for full analysis. Um, but we've not had any reports yet. This is the one, if any of you saw that television program, that was, was crouched, or it was, seems to have been buried in a, in a crouched position um, and had a very unfortunate jaw with the, with the teeth protruding almost at right angles to the, to the jaw. Um, it's believed to be a post-medieval burial. It's believed to be a covert burial, um, and presumably with Tintin being of, um, still of significance to whoever laid this poor individual um, in this spot. Likewise, these two children um, buried um, immediately below the Great East Window, um, one four to six years old, one 18 months to about two years old, um, both with irreg irregularities to the eye sockets, indicating sort of prolonged in illness of some kind, possibly malnutrition. Again, clearly a tragic episode, but Tintin meant something to whoever um, laid these two children um, beneath the east window. And to move us on to, um, to Monument Tintin, if you like, um, this is the north transept from the, from the, from the air, um, from a drone, um, a drone photography. This is the night stair up to the, um, uh, the many, all of you will know, I'm sure, going up to the, um, to the uh, dormitory in that area. This elaborate network of piping Clearly, this area has always been prone to water logging, and this water is taking it away to a sump pit in this, or a drainage pit in this sort of area. It's still um, very soggy today, and if you walk in that area um, before any of this work was done, the turf in this area always gets wettest quickest. Um, the most likely period for this happening is, is again, early conservation early 1900s. But I have a feeling that things go back much earlier here. If you can see in this photograph, we can see an area of tiled pavements. And we all got quite excited about this to begin with, um, wondering, tossing it back and forth, whether this in fact could be um, an in-situ pavement, which had been explored by um, uh, 
romantic, romantic period, and they'd just taken away the best ones and tossed them over and so forth. But Richard um, is now insistent that this is on a fresh mortar level above any other archaeology, and it has to be a post-medieval feature. If that is the case, I cannot, I cannot really see another episode other than um, under the Beauforts, um, and probably, for me, in the early 19th century. Although the 1750s is the most noted period for when you know, the, the big works were done, the big clearance, the, um, the dukes continued to have an, 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 uh, an agent on site who continued to do works, not just looking after the grass, but exploring other areas. And mid-19th century antiquarians refer to the good works done by these um, agents of the dukes. They were certainly working in the north transept um, and around the corner leading out to the processional doorway into the um, east um, cloister alley. The, there are documented works in that area. There is nothing in, in any tourist account that I can find which um, talks about a tile pavement in this area. They talk a lot about tiles. They talk a lot about them having been taken and, and collected. There was one area in the South Isle that was behind railings. Many, many more, tons of them, in fact, were stored in a barn um, at, the, at, the, at the site um, and eventually went to Badminton. But um, I, 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 I've flown several kites in this, in this talk, but I, I came across this drawing that... Um, uh, it's in the National Library of Wales... It's not, it, there's not a lot of it on the web. You know, some you find re repetitions of all that. It's the only one. And I can't help noting the sort of similarity in, um, in the arches here to the um, pulpit and screen that I showed you earlier. It's called the penitentiary cell, as you can see. I, it's just, it's totally flying a kite. Could there be some sort of feature that was built over this tiled area? No, no. Um, tourist or antiquarian refers to it, so it really. So I really have lost my marbles in many ways. But I just thought I couldn't resist throwing that in. And on that note, I'm afraid I'm well over time. I will have to finish. That's a nice way of putting it, John. Um, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Um, now, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, Richard, do we have any questions from our Zoom audience? Yeah, okay, Mike. No, 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 no Mike, Michael. One. Thank you. Well, it's just actually the online audience. Thank you, David. That was really wonderful. And also, thank you so much for, uh, I'm sure I'm speaking for loads of people in this room, to thank you for all that we owe you for your work on monastic architecture uh, and art and architecture over the years. Yeah. It really is. Uh, the, 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 the debt we owe you is phenomenal. And um, this was a really wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And um, the question, I'm going I'm to bring things up to date to an extent. And I was looking at the extent of the works that were conducted in the aftermath of World War I and thinking how much they must have cost. And was there contemporary political resonance or any objections to that amount of money being spent on preservation of the monument? Uh, that's a very interesting point, Michael. Um, there are figures, which I can't uh, quote at the moment. Um, there are figures, there are estimates, for example, for... Um, the woods and forests, they were very, very careful uh, with the spending, and Waller had to submit annual accounts um, to the woods and forest. Um, I've never tried working it out or adding it up. What I do know, and it's the obvious thing, is it, it was a bloody sight more than they thought it was going to be in the first place. But the works largely shut down um, 1415. It, it, it dribbled on for a bit, but there was only a skeleton skeletal crew there um, during the war. Um, and that's why I said, you know, 
it was parked, the problem of the South Nave Arcade was parked until 19, um, 1819, really, after the war. Um, and Baines himself, for example, went off to do war work, building munitions factories and that sort of thing, you know, all over the place. And it's what he got his knighthood for, for his, for his war work. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't arise, Michael, that I'm aware of, but it's an interesting point. Well, you know, it, it, it went on through the Depression, if you like, didn't it? In the 20s, it didn't finish till 28. But I haven't picked up on that, so it's an interesting one, which I will now look out for. That's in the immediate aftermath of the war, isn't it? That's I think, what I thought. Yeah. It is actually two places in the war. Digging out old sets, putting them into the factories. There is a, for example, a port in the Depression that goes back to the 20s. It's quite interesting when you read the diary entries. Um, but one of the problems that they have is they couldn't afford to do the port because ordinarily agricultural ports were collapsed upon the system of contract. So unless you did a system won't do it. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of the agriculture went to the Holy Territory or to the Dutch Territory or to the Netherlands or to Holland. Mm -hmm. So that's so they end up having to dig down into the ports. It's a real shock to the people. Mm -hmm. But that's only when you have the Holy Territory. Um, Thank you very much. That was a really fascinating um, lecture and presentation of Tinton. Was um, was there, is there any um, use of, of um, the stone from it um, by the Beauforts in, in, the, in their own buildings, or is there just no other sort of grand house in the area or anything that, for which use of this material would have been suitable? So, um, was it ever used as a quarry, in a sense, as, as so many of these buildings... Oh. Yes, probably more so than, than I am fully aware of. And but, where do you think the but for example, material is? Then? But for example, um, the Beauforts, um, the two, the one significant building is the, is the gatehouse chapel known as St Anne's House, which, which is a private house now, but un, until 1901, um, it had been the Beaufort agents um, lodging. Um, I, I'm ashamed again. Ugh. Too much in my head at the moment and not enough. Um, the last man whose name I cannot remember, he's the Baldwin. Um, Jay, not the actor. I was going to say Alec Baldwin then. Um, someone called J.W. Baldwin from memory. He's the one who ap apparently removed the remains of the Pulpitum screen. He swept those away as, as a mark of, or as as a reminder of the ongoing works that the Beauforts did, presumably with the, the, the then Duke's approval. He lived there. And when he retired, um, one of the Beaufort family, an unmarried lady, was, was, um, was given the house and the plot of land, which is all mapped out in a, in a Crayes Crown Estates um, plot in the TNA. Um, and then there was outrage when, when the woods and forests were were saying she's got to go. Um, anyway, the point, um, when, they, when they bought it, they thought, oh, she can stay there. But actually, no, we own that now as well. Um, and she had to go eventually. But the in the house, there are loads of tiles. There's a lot of the pulpitum screen, for example, just for example. There is probably some in what we now call the Beaufort Arms Hotel. Although recently, the Beaufort Arms Hotel, which, which is where all of the tourists stay, you know, it turns up, to, uh, is not the Beaufort Arms Hotel of later, which is the one immediately opposite the Abbey. It's higher up in the village, apparently. Um, and um, we haven't quite bottomed out what exactly is going on with the, with the, with the, with the hotel. I mean, it's been, I think mostly recently it's just been called the Abbey Hotel, I think. It's in a terrible state at the moment, has been for several years, with um, planning permissions hovering and so on and so forth. About his future use, but there's definitely medieval buildings there. But nothing major, Lindy, you know, no, no major house. Tiles went from um, tiles went from uh, Tintin itself to Windsor, to the Beaufort Chapel at Windsor, 
in the mid-19th century. John Lewis wrote a paper on this, um, and he had some idea of the quantity as well. They were only partially used, and I don't believe they're there today um, to see on the floor, but he had a large quantity of tiles taken to Windsor to, to uh, lay on the floor when the, um, when, the, when the chapel was being refurbished at some point. But so those are the, so I'm just grasping at a couple of points there of things being moved. No major building, nothing, badminton isn't built of Tintin that I'm aware of. Moving on from that, what happened to the stained glass that you say was excavated? Um, it's all in boxes at the moment. It's quite, it's, it's, it's quite fragile. Um, it's, it's very fragile, in fact, but it is in boxes and in, you know, acid-free paper and so on, and it's, it is part, all, all built into a post-excavation program. Um, is that, is that, have you found collections of fragmented glass elsewhere? Just no, um, across the site, really. Um, there are pockets. Um, there are pockets, but across the site, you know, outside the East End, for example, there were some in the trenches dug there around the south. But the largest quantity from memory was in that area outside the North Isle of the Presbytery, on top of that wall, which is a mystery. But by, but by the hearth? Um, not very far from the hearth. Not very far from the hearth, yeah. Awkward question, perhaps, but you've um, spoken of how past conservers of the building have projected the uh, afterlife of their work. How are you not going to make yours as temporary? Um, are you thinking of re-roofing, for no, example? No, um, um, And do you feel, as I do, that it would be good to have the ivy back? Uh, <laughs> Which is, after all, an important part of the image of Tintin Abbey that many yeah, of us have. Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't disagree with the, the last um, in terms of sentiment, but um, it, 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 apparently it wouldn't do the masonry any, any, any good. Um, That's why what, we pulled what, it off the back is, of my house, is, but yeah. What is being discussed is, is turf capping, which, um, which I think is going to have to come. Um, it... it it's, it's, it's being used increasingly. David Odgers, do you pre presume a lot of you know David Odgers, he's a marvellous chap, but he's, he's, he's convinced that we should be doing it. Of course, there is the aesthetic thing, in the same way that, that, that the inside has been turfed, and Jeremy Knight, who was the inspector for many years, there was talk in, during his um, era of we've got to get rid of this turf, you know, it's just not manageable anymore. We don't have the labour force to deal with it like they did in the in the 20s and 30s, we're going to have to, you know, slab it stone over my dead body, kind of thing, you know. So there, there are. But um, I think we are facing up to the fact what what that means in terms of uh, a department of Welsh government or an arm of Welsh government. That look, let's be realistic about this. We're going to take down the scaffolding five, six, seven years on. We're going to have to think about going back to Tintin again. You know, all one can do is the best one can do in this program, you know, working with Masons. Um, Od the Odgers team will be there taking decisions with them as to the most appropriate things, pins, um, laminates, all sorts of stuff, you know. The, 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 the best that, 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 that the modern experts can come up with. But the reality is, if, if the atmosphere stays as it does, the nature of the stone is not going to change, so it is going to continue to deteriorate. You know, you can do an, you can do an historic Scotland and give up and say, we're just going to let it fall down. We can't, can't save it anymore. And it's, it's a big moral question because the budgets for these things, you know, are going to be astronomical. And in, and in, the, in today's climate, that doesn't sound good. Can, can you just say a bit more about the stone and, and why it's so problematical? Um, it, it's local stone, is it sort of, um, and I mean, you said, you said they'd, um, one of the problems is um, 
late 19th, early 20th century mortar. Yeah. Um, but, but obviously a serious problem is the stone itself, the actual quality of the stone. Yeah, there's, 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 no, there's not an easy answer to that, Bindi, and there's no one single factor. Okay. Um, and I'm not the expert in this area, I'm not an expert in any area, but I'm it, certainly is not... It a type but of limestone? Or yeah, no, it's... it's, it's no. We, in, in, in the late 1990s, um, some t two nice gentlemen from the British Geological Survey spent several days there. One was, his name was Graham Lott. I can't remember the name of the other chap. He was marvellous, and he, he said, um, I think we'll find it quite quickly. And they did what they did, drilling cores and so on. And they told us that, um, so if you're at the west front of Tintin, um, I, can't, I can't really show you on this slide on the thing because it's off. But fr from the west front of Tintin, if you sort of look in that direction from the west front at the, at the hill, it's called Barbados Hill. I don't know why, I've never bottomed that out, but it's called Barbados. That is the source of the majority of the, of the sandstone. Now, one of the problems, again, it's not my thing, um, it's, 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 it's the bedding is either like this, you know, um, and they've used it like this, or it's the other way around. And apparently you can't do that. As you know more about that, Richard. Yeah. Um, and so, in, when they when they when they producing long mullions and so on, they're working in the wrong plane, and it's you know it's coming apart in that direction. Um, and as for the early conservation works, um, Will the inspector, um, he's got a better way of putting it. It's the hardest substance known to mankind, kind of thing. Something that's that's in the literature, and there's a lot of literature on this. Goes back conservationist it's either called biddeford or breed and gravel it's it's got this kind of little pebbly um pebble dash kind of finish to it um and it is like rock you know you take a hammer to it and and the stone either side of it will crack before it will so if the stone cannot escape through the original mortar joints it is coming out through the face of the stone which is another significant issue the water uh, did i what was i saying stone water yeah, I, I was sort of, yeah, water. Um, and apparently, if we if we don't put a roof on it, um, or if they don't put a roof on it, turf capping is 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 the next best kind of solution. Because it makes through water. It 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 it, it cope with a fair amount of water. Um, Yeah, you know, I th yeah. I think there is. I think there's now enough um, historic data to say it's not. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. It's actually better than you might think. It's on the. It's been on top of the walls um, at Falaise, for example. There's quite an area there. Um, there are no ash trees that, I, that I'm aware of. I think they've used some at Glastonbury. Um, it's on the walls at Cardiff. Cardiff Castle has used it. There's enough historic data that um, David Hodges believes, and I think um, English Heritage had just produced, Historic England have just produced a research report on turf capping, I believe. And, oh, it's done a Wigmore, of course. That was an early one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the biggest issue is the aesthetic one. You know, it'll just change the appearance. But the tiled roof, um, I was heartbroken when the tiled roof had to go in 1900. Uh, 1999-2010 uh, program, the, the lattice girder roof over the south aisle was covered with, um, with um, tile, stone tiles. Um, they had to go, apparently, and so it's now leaded. It's taken me a long while to get used to this. It's, it's the aesthetics one is used to. It. It's kind of difficult to do a gear shift. Has any attempt been made recently in the present program of research and so forth, or has it been done over time? And that is to record, or in some cases, reconstruct the profiles. Because, I mean, there's a, builder, a Gothic building like this, the profiles are very important. And um, 
there must be an archive going back at least to the, I can't remember his first name, but Sharp with a knee on the end of Sharp's yeah. Parallels yeah. fame, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he did some drawing yeah. with Tintin there. And it, of course, it all depends on what is going to be done with the masonry in the future, but as, still, I do think it's important that we know and we continue to know what the actual three-dimensional physical shape of this yeah. building was when it, before its surfaces be, began to go so badly. You know. I, I, I couldn't agree more, Christ, Christopher. Um, beyond Edmund Sharp, I think it's Edmund Sharp, yes. the, the better collection of Tintin drawings, in fact, Joseph Potter's, which you will know, um, he was going to do this monastic, um, monastic architecture of Great Britain, you know, and he only got as far as one volume, and it covers Bildwas and Tintin. And, and there are drawings of every last nook and cranny there, profile drawings. Now, Richard Morris, of blessed memory, um, worked, did some work for Caddo in the, um, at the time the West Front was done, and he checked the Potter profiles against um, his own drawings of the West Front when he was able to get up at the scaffolding at that time. And he produced new profiles of a lot of the West Front at that time. But in all honesty, other than, other than what Masons have done themselves in preparing um, new stone for some of the windows, in the, in the 80s in particular, I'd have said, very, as far as I can see or tell, little was done in terms of new stonework um, in the 1900, well, other than the mullion and the east window, there are tracery drawings which are, which, are, which are part of the Cadu archive, which has now gone to the National Monuments Record Wales. There hasn't been a systematic program, and I would be disappointed if we didn't um, capture what we can when the scaffolding goes up in, in this mm. period. In, in, the, in um, the West Front, I'm sorry, pro prolonging this answer, but in the West Front, when they did the, 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 the new um, quatrefoil filling to the oculi, in, the, um, in that West Front window. The decision was taken, unless we do this now, we could probably patch it up, but we've got just about enough to faithfully repeat the profiles of the, of, of the mouldings. And so in its way, that serves as an archive of what was there before. We've got the Richard drawings as well in that case. More of that, I suspect, is going to have to go on in this, in this phase of works. Do we need to put in a new cut piece there which preserves um, the, the, even if it's taken from several places, um, we know the cusping is pretty similar all along here. The profiles, they were cutting to, this, to the same form. And so I suspect that will go on. Um, but I would be disappointed if we did not record all that we can at this point. Sadly, an awful lot has gone since Potter's time. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I'm simply actually going to uh, wind things up now because it's nearly uh, half past six. And thank you very much, everybody, actually, for your uh, contributions, um, particularly uh, th great thanks to, uh, to David. Um, uh, before you go, I'd also like to announce that the next lecture, which will be the last in the 2023-24 season, uh, will be delivered by Eve Gallo, uh, who is going to talk about uh, recent discoveries uh, at Notre Dame as a result of the uh, of the fire some five years ago, um, uh, in what I think really is going to be the, f the first significant sort of exposition really in English of the sort of state of understanding as it now is at, uh, at Notre Dame. So I hope you'll be able to join us all for that at sort of five o'clock on Wednesday the 1st of May. Um, and to thank David actually for a really splendid talk. Thank you very much, thank David. You. Sorry, but before you go, please.